Hi students, welcome to lesson 35, Women's Movements in India. The women's movement in India have a long history. However, the goal, its form and outreach, its inclusiveness has undergone changes over the years. Patriarchy, caste system and several other social and religious ideas and practices which have originated in the ancient Indian social milieu continue to dominate our anthropological thinking about the social status and position of Indian women. They are still relevant issues for women empowerment and overall development. Objectives. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to understand women's movements in the colonial period, women's movements in the post-colonial period that is during independent period, women's movements in India since the 1970s and 1980s. Let us now discuss about the distinct phases of women's movements in India. The beginning of women's movements is reflected through social reform movement in the 19th century. The movement can be divided into three distinct phases. The first phase is during colonial period which includes social reform movement, national movement and social reform legislation in the colonial period. The second phase is during post-independent India and third phase is of women's movements in India since the 1970s. Let us now talk about women's movements in colonial period. The women's movements in the colonial period are mainly of two different concerns. Firstly, social reform movements and secondly, the nationalist movements. Social reform movements. The women's movements in modern India began as a social reform movement in the 19th century. The British annexation and its rule over India brought about drastic change in Indian society. The new land revenue settlements, commercial agriculture and infrastructural facilities like roads, railways, postal and telegraph services, English education, etc. introduced by the British led to a significant change. The ideas of rationalism and liberalism started influencing the social and cultural milieu. This influence led to efforts for creating a new society which was modern yet rooted in Indian tradition. The new society to be free from social problems like polygamy, casteism, female infanticide, parda system, sati, child marriage, absence of education, all of which they were believed to be the impediments to progress of women. There were two groups of social reformers during this phase. Firstly, liberal reformers and secondly, the revivalists. Both the groups certainly recognized the repressive customs inherent in Indian society. The liberal reformers put forth their work for the cause of women, whereas the focus of revivalist was on program of the revival at the Vedic society in modern India. The Vedic period as described in Rig Veda depicts a highly evolved society in which women played a highly significant role in orienting life and the family. They were accorded equal status and privileges along with men and were second to none. Social reformers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, Keshap Chandra Sen, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, Kandukuri Viresh Lingam Pantulu, M. G. Ranade, D. K. Karve, Swami Vivekanand, Swami Dayanand Saraswati and others provided leadership to the women's movement by recognizing the degraded position of Indian women. The social reformers concentrated their attention on important aspects of women like sati, age of marriage, the sad plight of widows and their right to remarry. 
one of the best advocates of liberalism was raja ram mohan roy who advocated equality between men and women and declared that women were not inferior to men morally and intellectually Roy's attention was drawn towards the inhuman practice of sati after female infanticide. From 1818 onwards, he began his active propaganda through speeches and writings against sati. Largely because of his effort and persuasion, the East India Company declared sati practice illegal and a punishable offence in 1829. Raja Ram Mohan Roy also opposed other evils like early marriage, polygamy, etc. He supported female education and widow and inter-caste marriage. Brahmo Samaj, founded by Raja Ram Mohan Roy, played a significant role in reform activities concerning women. Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar strongly propagated widow remarriage the child marriage evil resulted in large numbers of young girls ending up as widows whose lives were miserable due to the severe restrictions imposed on them he argued in favor of widow remarriage and published his work on widow remarriage in 1853 Arya Samaj established by Dayanand Saraswati in 1875 emphasized compulsory education of both boys and girls a series of schools for women Arya Kanya Pathashalas were the first rigorous effort of the Samaj to promote women's education in a systematic way Prarthana Samaj founded in 1867 had leaders like M G Ranade N G Chandrasekhar and R G Bhandarkar it concentrated more on sponsoring education for women both brahma samaj and prarthana samaj made influential efforts to prove that hindu religious tradition was not the source of legitimacy for the distressed condition of women in society Jyoti Rao was the one to open first girls school in India. He is also credited with opening first home for widows and a home for newborn girl children so that they can be saved from female infanticide. The efforts of Vidya Sagar, Keshab Chandra Sen, DK Karve resulted in the enactment of Widow Remarriage Act of 1856. In the south, Kandukuri Vireshalingam led the widow remarriage movement. In 1874, he performed 63 widow remarriages throughout the Madras Presidency and financially supported men who married widows by providing them houses and other benefits. Between 1855 and 1858, while he was inspector of schools, Vidya Sagar established 48 girls schools. M G Ranade, along with his wife, propagated female education and started a girls high school in 1884. The limited enforcement and practicability of legislations like Widow Remarriage Act of 1856 and others in a tradition-bound society was recognized by D K Karve, who therefore concentrated his efforts on promoting education among widows. In 1896 Karve along with 15 of his colleagues founded the Anant Balika Ashram for education of widows where the courses were framed with the objective of making widows self reliant he also started Mahila Vidyalaya in 1907 and SNDT Women's University in 1916 a separate educational institution for women so as to lessen the resistance of orthodox section with regard to women's education the social reform movement in its later phases resulted in producing women social reformers who worked for their own cause pandita ramabai started sharda sadan in bombay in 1889 to provide an ashram to destitute high caste widows In 1912 and 1913 a widow's home was established by sister Subbu Lakshmi another widow in Madras another important aspect of social reform movement phase of women in India was that of property rights for Hindu women
Swami Vivekananda, Swami Dayanand Saraswati and Annie Besant were the prominent reformers of the revivalist group who also worked for the cause of Indian women. Muslim women in India made little progress in their position both in pre-British period or the later British period. The efforts towards education and association formation among Muslim women did not begin until the 20th century. One notable exception being the Tayabji family of Bombay. Badruddin Tayabji, who graduated from Elphinstone College, founded a Muslim Self Help Association in 1876. Thus, the social reformers laid the foundation of the women's movement in India. Social reform movement was the first attempt to remove the obstacles in the life of women. It created awareness among the people that women must be liberated and be made equal of men. Nationalist movements. As a result of the social reform movement of the 19th century, the social evils were eliminated and opportunities were provided to women for their education. The expansion of women's education and their admission to educational institutions had produced a sizable number of English educated middle class women by the late 19th century and they made their presence felt in political activities. Till 1919, the national movement was limited to the urban upper class and it was later with Gandhiji's entrance into the national movement, participation of the masses began to take place. In this phase, political developments and women's participation in national movement went hand in hand. The partition of Bengal in 1905 resulted in the launching of Swadeshi movement by the nationalists. Women contributed their gold bangles, nose rings and bracelets to the national fund. In villages, women started putting away a handful of grain daily for such purposes. The women of Bengal and Punjab took active part in Swadeshi movement. The women workers of the Ari Samaj were also responsible for arousing national spirit among people. Swarna Kumari, sister of Rabindranath Tagore and her daughter Sarla Devi were strong supporters of the Swadeshi movement. Important women who participated in the revolutionary activities were Mrs. Shyamji Krishnavarma, Ms. P. Nauroji, Ms. M. Chattopadhyay and Madam Bhikaji Rustam, K. R. Kame, a regular among the Indian revolutionaries based in Europe, coordinated to the activities of the revolutionaries. She also raised issues of women's equality at international socialist circles reflecting the Indian reality. The period from 1911 to 1918 is of great significance in the history of Indian national movement because for the first time a woman, Annie Besant, led the national movement as president of Indian National Congress. The setting up of Home Rule League and organization of the Home Rule agitation raised the tempo of the movement. The important achievement of women's movement in India during the second phase was founding of Women's Indian Association WIA. Pandita Ramabai's Sharda Sadhan in 1892 in Pune, Sri Mahipatram Rupram Anantashram in Ahmedabad in 1892, Sri Zoroastrian Mandal in Bombay 1903, Maternity and Child Welfare League in Baroda 1914, Bhagini Samaj in Pune in 1916, all were established and worked with the particular objective of improving women's lives. Gandhiji launched an All India Satyagraha in 1919 against the provocative enactment of the Rowlett Act. Women took out processions, propagated the use of khadi and even quoted jail. Though a few number of women were arrested, yet a beginning was made. The non-cooperation movement in 1920 awakened the women of all sections and imparted 
first lessons in satyagraha after the struggle for franchise for the first time indian women exercised their vote in the elections of 1926 the franchise granted to women was very restricted the first women to stand for election was kamla devi chattopadhyay madras was the first state which nominated a woman member dr muttu lakshmi reddy to the legislative council she saw to the enactment of abolition of devdasi system and laws to close brothels and protect the minor girls she brought amendments to the children's act and worked for the creation of healthy schools a large number of women including sarojini naidu actively took part in dandi march in 1930 women participated by breaking salt laws forest laws taking out processions picketing schools colleges legislative councils and clubs during the civil disobedience movement of 1930 kamla devi chattopadhyay addressed meetings and picketed foreign clothes and liquor shops she was in charge of the women's wing of the hindustan seva dal The inauguration of provincial autonomy under the India Act of 1935 gave women an opportunity to be elected to the state legislatures and also become administrators. In the elections of 1937, eight women were elected from the general constituencies, 42 from the reserved constituencies, and five were nominated to the upper house when the ministries were formed. and 10 women took office one as minister and others as deputy speakers and parliamentary secretaries the quit india movement was launched by gandhi ji in 1942 with the significant slogan do or die the women not only led processions and held demonstrations but also organized camps in which they were given training in civil duties and first aid and were educated on democracy in the indian national army of netaji subhash chandra bose rani jhansi regiment was created for women women were trained in nursing social service and to use weapons thus women took part in various activities of the national movement the specific feature of this phase of women's movement is the establishment of several women's organizations led by women themselves on an all india basis to enhance their social economic cultural and political scene women's movements in post independent period 15th august 1947 marked the end of the colonial rule in india and the country found itself standing on the threshold of a new era wherein the task was to build a strong nation while india found itself independent from the british it was still to find independence from social economic political problems that hindered india's growth story during this period the social reformists tried to channelize the indian society by introducing constitutional and legal provisions and protecting the society and women from discrimination and by providing equality to all citizens irrespective of caste creed race religion and sex Let us discuss two prominent movements in post independent India beginning with Chipko movement Chipko movement was born in a small hilly village Adwani in Tehri Gadwal district of Uttar Pradesh now in Uttarakhand The illiterate Adivasi women led this movement in December 1972 It challenged the old belief that Forests mean only timber and emphasized their roles in making soil, water and pure air as the basis of human life. This philosophy popularized the movement in many countries. The women symbolically tied sacred threads around the trees, faced police firing in February 1978 and later also courted arrest. 
This movement continued under the leadership of Sri Sundar Lal Bahuguna in various villages. The movement's plan is a slogan to plant five Fs: food, fodder, fuel, fiber, and fertilizer to make communities self-sufficient in all their basic needs. The Chipko women believed that trees were alive and could breathe like them. Thus, trees should be respected. Besides, supporting agriculture and animal husbandry, the forest grew medicinal herbs used for healing powers. The Chipko movement is nationally and internationally discussed as the people's ecological movement for the protection of the natural environment. Men migrated to the plains and women were left to cope with an impoverished existence and to provide for the old and children. Women repeatedly challenged administrators and politicians stating planning without fodder, fuel and water is one-eyed planning. In the course of this movement, Gadwal women successfully undertook leadership roles and questioned the right of the men to decide the fate of the forest or to enter into contracts without consulting them who were the worst affected. The forests were these women's home and hence they would not let it be cut down. Let us now talk about anti-Iraq movement. The anti-Iraq movement of women in Andhra Pradesh was one of the most historic and significant movements of the 1990s. Women have played a historic role in bringing about a ban on consumption and sale of distilled liquor in Andhra Pradesh. The movement indeed was not just for elimination of liquor but for the protection and survival of their lives and culture. The movement was started in a small village, Dubagunta, in Nellore district of Andhra Pradesh. The main reason for the movement was said to be the successful literacy mission that has been going on in Nellore district from 2nd January 1990 and was implemented from January 1991. This program was implemented in a very innovative way with recognition of development as an instrument of change and empowerment of women. Hence, a campaign approach was adopted to spread the message of literacy. Primers were written, popular performances used and the center for people's awareness was created. Besides, these cultural committees were organized to convey the meaning and need for literacy in the forms of songs, dance, dramas and street plays. The Dubagunta episode was soon quoted in another literacy primer under the title Adavalu Ekamaite that is, if women unite. Anti-Arab movement was very effective against local Arab shops, excise officials, liquor contractors and all the machineries of the state involved in the trade. This movement gave tremendous self-confidence and sense of power to women who realized their strength and used it to their benefit. Let us now discuss about women's movements in India since the 1970s and 1980s. In the post-independence period during the first few decades, the major concern was for overall economic growth. Gender issues were subsumed in poverty related concerns and there were no specific programs which aimed at women. Women during this period were involved in such movements like the law and famine relief movement but did not start to pick up issues involving their oppression until the 1970s. NGOs and other such organizations from the 70s started emphasizing on women's development and provided women avenues of collectively voicing their concerns. Ideals of equal status and important provisions for welfare of women were incorporated into the Indian constitution while the pre-independent legislative acts continued to be in force. The constitution guaranteed equal rights to both the sexes. 
Article 15 and Article 16, Clause 2 of the Constitution forbids discrimination and accepts all as equal in the eyes of the law. In the early 1950s, a series of legislations such as Hindu Marriage Act 1955, Hindu Succession Act 1956, Dowry Prohibition Act 1961 and Equal Remuneration Act 1976 were passed. The emergence of independent India as a welfare state also affected the counters of Indian women's movement. The government Central Social Welfare Board established in 1953 promotes welfare and development services for women, children and underprivileged sections of the society. It has a nationwide program for grants in aid for welfare activities with a special emphasis on women's welfare. Till 1970s, a kind of passivity or accommodation due to socio-economic circumstances of free India influenced women's movement. The economic crisis of 1960s created an atmosphere in which issues concerning women started receiving attention. International Women's Decade between 1975 to 1985 saw the emergence of autonomous women's movements in which autonomous women's groups and organizations started fighting for liberation. Important features of the women's autonomous movements are that women organized themselves and led the movements and fought against oppression, exploitation, injustice and discrimination. The autonomous women's organizations took up issues related to women's operations like dowry, violence within the family, alcoholism among men and wife beating, discrimination at the workplace etc. to mobilize women for collective action. For the first time some groups in Mumbai, Delhi, Hyderabad, Patna raised issues such as sexual exploitation of poor scheduled caste and scheduled tribe women by the upper caste landlords. Issues of rape, dowry, murders, crime and violence against women were taken up. All India anti-dowry and anti-rape movements were launched by women's organizations and civil liberties and democratic rights organizations also joined them. They launched important issue based movements. In the late 1980s, the government prepared a national perspective plan for women 1988-2000 which was made several recommendations relating to legal, economic, social and political status of women. The National Commission for Women was set up in 1992 envisaging to cover all facets of issues relating to safeguarding women's rights and promotion of their empowerment. It was visualized as an expert body to advise the government on women's issues and be a powerful advocate of their rights and hence a statutory body to lend it independence. Besides this, the government has come out with various programs such as Rashtriya Mahila Kosh, Indra Mahila Yojana, Balika Samriddhi Yojana, Swashakti Project etc. for the benefit of women. Taking note of women's role in nation building activities, the government had declared 2001 as the year of women's empowerment by adopting a national policy to offer swashakti to women. Several laws have also been adopted to empower women socially, economically, legally and politically. The Department of Women and Child Development was set up in the year 1985 as a part of Ministry of Human Resource Development to give the much needed impetus to holistic development of women and children. With effect from 30th January 2006, the department has been upgraded to a ministry. The Government of India has set up a national mission for empowerment of women and the same has been notified on 8th March 2010. 
the mission aims at implementing the women centric programs in a mission mode to achieve better coordination the ministry of women and child development is administering the support to training and employment program of women that is step a scheme with a view to help assetless and marginalized women become economically self reliant beti bachao beti padhao scheme 2015 is significant in girl education giving much scope for women development and empowerment dear students let us summarize this lesson unlike the women's movements in america and britain in india the concern for women's freedom was first espoused by enlightened males during the british era who had imbibed liberal ideas up to 1920s the struggle was carried on by men it was only after mahatma gandhi's entry into politics that the nationalist movement under his leadership was transformed from a middle class movement into a mass movement where women for the first time raised their voices against the disabilities that they suffered it is the women's movement in india that has been the force behind the long struggle of women's advancement from subordination to gender equality and finally to women's empowerment though a lot needs to be achieved and there are various impediments in making this reality available to a large section of women the women's movement has brought women's issues center stage and made them more visible